Good evening and welcome everyone to First Unitarian Church of Honolulu's weekly How Hana, our happy hour time together, as odd as you use are, instead of doing this on Friday like the rest of Hawaii, we do it on Tuesdays uh, because Friday evening people, this, this congregation's got plans. So uh, one of the things we've been doing is inviting wonderful members of our community to be with us and to share some of their experiences and uh, ideas and things like that. And today is no different. One of my friends and one of my colleagues who, uh, and one of my confidants in the area of migration and immigration and how those forces are shaping this island and how they're impacting the lives of those, of this, of those we share this island with is with us. Uh, Esther Yu from the legal clinic who this congregation has supported and who we love and so uh, we just want to say hi Esther and ask you to unmute yourself and uh, and say hi and just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome. Uh, thank you Pastor TJ. Uh, thank you for the welcome um, thank, and thank you for inviting me to uh, your congregations, Pauhana. Uh, I feel really honored to um, be here with you guys tonight and just talk a little bit about what I do. Um, uh, so for a little background information about myself, I, um, I was born in California uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, my parents are both uh, immigrants from South Korea um, and so I grew up, you know, I had a very good, great childhood actually, um, and spent the first 18 years of my life in a sleepy suburb of Los Angeles. Hmm. Uh, and then I went to college on the East Coast and, um, uh, so I went, I went to Harvard for undergrad, um, and spent some years there and then I came back to LA and um, I, I, I did a lot of moving back and forth between the coasts uh, because I, I then got engaged to my now husband and he uh, decided to go to law school um, at Harvard Law and he's now a professor at um, the University of Hawaii uh, William Richardson School of Law so that's why we moved here to Hawaii um, but yeah so I spent most of my time between Boston and then Los Angeles uh, I always considered LA to be sort of my spiritual home because it's where I grew up um, but it's also where I had uh, this uh, Korean immigrant community that basically raised me. Um, and I went to law school at UCLA. Um, and then after law school, I worked at a law firm in Los Angeles and actually in Century City, uh, where I did a little bit of uh, entertainment law. Um, so very different from what I'm doing now. Um, I mostly represented, you know, I was on teams that represented um, studios uh, in all kinds of litigation. So like disputes about contracts or uh, about copyright. Uh, Pastor TJ knows a lot about uh, intellectual property <laughs> litigation. Um, so I did that only for a short period of time. Um, and it was exciting, you know, it's exciting to be in Hollywood and representing, you know, uh, the big studios on, you know, movies that we've all heard of, like the um, Lord of the Rings or James Bond, all these like cool things. Um, but I think even from the very beginning, I always wanted uh, to uh, practice law um, with, uh, you know, just keeping in mind like who I am and my roots uh, as the daughter of immigrants. Um, and I really wanted to like serve people and I did that when I was at a law firm and I was doing pro bono cases. I would do eviction defense cases and, um, uh, you know, volunteered for like adoption cases and things like that. Um, and then uh, one day I also, I got an email um, from 
someone, I can't remember who it is now, but they were uh, asking uh, around to see if any lawyers were interested in taking an asylum case uh, for uh, someone who had come here from El Salvador. And um, when I read the facts of her case, uh, I was moved to uh, volunteer for that case. And so my friend and I, who had actually, my friend had actually done an immigration asylum case before. So I partnered with her because this was my first one. Um, we we uh, took the case and this client was a uh, transgender woman from El Salvador who had basically been trafficked and, um, uh, you know, raped and uh, assaulted, even by police, uh, both in El Salvador and Mexico, uh, before she ended up escaping, uh, like a forced prostitution situation in Mexico. She escaped and she came to California. And so we helped her, you know, file her asylum application. And that case really, um, you know, uh, kind of, uh, a, wakened me up a bit to the situation of people who are seeking asylum in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, I did, I, I, I helped with that case, um, but then shortly thereafter, I decided, I took a job um, clerking for a federal district court judge in Los Angeles. Um, and my judge's name is Dolly G. And she is, uh, I believe, the first female uh, Ch Chinese American uh, federal court judge in the country. And uh, I was very really excited to clerk for her because uh, we shared, you know, roots in Los Angeles. She was also the daughter of immigrants. Um, her mother grew up, uh, or when she was, her mother worked in a garment factory. Um, sewing and um, and uh, and so and then my judge uh, when she was a practicing lawyer was a uh, like a labor lawyer so she represented unions um, and then she became a judge uh, so while I was clerking for her that year it was like 2015 um, we happened to get a case uh, that turned into uh, you know, a big deal nationally. It made the national news. So um, the case involved um, children um, at the border who were being detained uh, along with their mothers in uh, family detention centers that they were setting up um, in Texas. Um, and what happened in this case, so this case is called uh, Flores and um, what happened was that in the, I believe around 1985 was when this case was first filed um, in federal court. Um, and what had happened was that the attorneys who filed the case had found out, um, I believe through the housemaid or housekeeper of a celebrity in Los Angeles <laughs> that, um, there were children being detained by INS, which is what the immigration agency was called back then. Uh, they were being detained uh, by INS in uh, abandoned homes in Hollywood, and um, they were being held there uh, with uh, adults that they weren't related to. They were being strip searched, um, and they were basically being treated horribly and in a way that like no child should ever be treated. So these lawyers brought this case uh, during the Reagan administration and it took a really long time um, and it went up and down through all the courts. And in 1997, I believe, um, and it, during the Clinton administration, uh, INS finally settled the case. Um, with the plaintiff's attorneys. Um, and this was during Janet Reno's, when she was attorney general. Um, and they settled it and they wrote this agreement, um, and, which is now called the Flores Agreement. Um, and basically said, you know, 
children should not be kept in detention centers for any longer than necessary. And if they are kept in detention centers, they, they, these conditions should, you know, apply, right? So sanitary conditions. <laughs> um, and they should be released as soon as possible, as soon as the government can find, you know, an, an adult like relative, for example, in the United States. Uh, that they can release them to. Um, and they shouldn't be held in detention centers, you know, while they're waiting for like their asylum case to be heard. Um, so that was 1997. And then uh, the, I think that it was pretty quiet in that case until 2015. Um, and the previous judge on that actually passed away. Um, so what happened is there was a settlement agreement and then, um, it became a consent decree, which means that the court continues to like monitor and to make sure that the government is following the terms of this agreement. Um, so, so nothing happened for a long time. And then in 2015, um, unfortunately under the Obama administration, the Department of Homeland Security started uh, making contracts with a lot of private prison, um, companies to create what they called family detention centers. And they uh, would keep uh, children along with uh, their mothers in these detention centers. And so the plaintiff's attorneys in the Flores case came back to court. And this time it was my judge's case. Um, and uh, I happened to be the clerk that was helping her, you know, uh, read all the affidavits in the case, read all the declarations, uh, research the law, all that stuff, um, and help draft the order. So, so uh, the plaintiff's attorneys came back to court and said, uh, look, this is a violation of this agreement that we've had. Um, and then the government also like filed a motion saying, hey, we'd like to change the agreement to permit what we're doing because um, there are so many people trying to cross the border right now from the Northern Triangle countries like El Salvador and Honduras. Um, and we want to send them a message uh, to deter them from coming um, and basically say, look, if you bring your kids here, uh, we're going to put them in a detention center indefinitely, right? Um, and so I mean, that's like an impermissible purpose. <laughs> and the whole thing was just an affront, I think, to uh, like a morality, I think. Um, but of course, we couldn't, I mean, as lawyers and um, as judges, we couldn't obviously just say this is immoral <laughs> as much as we would like to sometimes. Um, but instead, you know, we treated, well, of course, we followed the law, we treated the settlement agreement like a contract, and we interpreted the terms of the contract. And so uh, Judge G, you know, uh, released this order saying, you know, the children can't be kept there, according to this agreement. And then she had also interpreted the agreement to say that if the parents uh, that they were being held with can be released like after a bond like after a normal bond hearing right if they determine that the parents are not a danger to public safety or they're not a flight risk and they're going to appear for their court uh case then they have to be released you know uh, as well as the children um unfortunately so the government appealed that order uh, to the ninth circuit and the ninth circuit panel agreed with judge she that the agreement said that children cannot be kept, you know, in these detention centers, but then they disagreed and said, no, they don't have, the government doesn't have to release the parents as well. So unfortunately, um, you know, two years later, we have the family separation crisis uh, where the government says, okay, we're gonna release the kids because the court, that's what the court told us, we have to do that. Um, but under Trump's uh, zero tolerance policy, he says, no, we're not going to release the parents as well. So we're going to separate these kids from their parents. Um, and I think that the Trump administration really tried to pin the blame 
on the courts on Judge G, essentially saying like, she, well, she told us to release the kids, um, but we don't have to release the parents. Whereas under uh, the Obama administration, once uh, that order went into effect, they just released the parents as well because they realized they didn't want to separate the kids and the parents. Um, so that led to that family separation crisis. And then, um, and then I think the day after, you know, they started doing that, you know, Trump issued this order to Justice, who was attorney general at the time, saying, um, I want you to go back to Judge G and ask her again. <laughs> it's kind of like holding, trying to hold a judge hostage, kind of, you know, ask her again, you know, if we can keep the kids indefinitely, you know. So that, that litigation has been going on and on, you know, since 2015. And now there have been like a number of law clerks that have worked on the case. But I think that it, that case was a real turning point for me because, um, you know, I was an entertainment lawyer before that. And then, and then I see this case and I read the declarations from, you know, mothers and talking about, you know, sleeping in cells, standing up, holding their babies. Uh, it's very cold. Uh, I don't have, we don't get enough to eat, like, and it just kind of changed, uh, it really opened my eyes to how inhumane uh, our immigration system is, and I think ever since then, I just see that more and more, actually. Um, so, so, um, so after the clerkship, uh, I lived in Maine for about four years, because again, my husband uh, as an academic, he got his first teaching job there. And then we moved to Hawaii. And that's where I started. This is where I started working um, full time as an immigration lawyer and not just doing pro bono asylum cases. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't, so I don't want to go on and on, Pastor TJ, but that's sort of like the, the beginnings of what I, uh, how I, how I became an immigration lawyer. But yeah, that's great. Thank yeah. you. That's a very comprehensive. I saw lots of nods and and this <laughs> when you were talking about the the way uh, people are treated or human beings yeah. are being treated. Um, can you say something about uh, what's the legal clinic doing? I mean, you could talk about maybe what it generally was supposed to do and sort of what's on your what what's on your plate right now. What kind of things are you working on now? I saw I saw John, you know, from the law school at the beach the other day. And we all were like, I don't know what's going on with immigration law. So do whatever you can. I mean, maybe explain why John and I both said that right now, the insanity that's happening. But in general, what's the legal clinic supposed to be doing? And, and what are you doing right now amid the complete catastrophe that is uh, the interpretation of these laws? So, Yeah, so um, I think I'm with you and John in the sense that the last, even just we started in September of last year, and since then, um, you know, I've seen about a hundred individuals um, and kind of advise them about their immigration situation, or you know, actually started taking on their cases and helping them with their immigration um, situation. So, uh, you know, for those who are unfamiliar with immigration law, there's I sort of divide immigration law practice into two buckets. The first bucket are um, contains like the affirmative applications that people submit in order to get some immigration benefit. So whether it's a green card or a fiance visa or um, work permit or uh, a citizenship naturalization, um, so we help a lot of people um, who are, well, first of all, all of our clients are low income. So our mission is obviously to help people who cannot afford a private lawyer. Um, and secondly, you know, in Hawaii, there are actually very few immigration lawyers, which is surprising when I moved here because Hawaii is such a diverse state that has a lot of immigrants, so it was surprising to um, to learn that there are very few uh, people practicing immigration law. 
um, and I think John said there's like a do less than a dozen, I think, lawyers. Um, and I think about a fifth of Hawaii's population um, are immigrants. So it, it was shocking. And then on top of that, you know, uh, the amount of services available for the low income who cannot afford uh, private uh, legal services is even fewer, you know, we're a very small group. So, so that's our mission to help them. And uh, so a large part of my practice is obviously helping people figure out, okay, am I eligible for citizenship? Am I eligible for a green card? Um, how do I apply? We help people fill out those applications. We help them figure out what documents they need. Uh, many of them are uh, not primarily English uh, speaking, so there's an uh, an additional obstacle, you know, even for something that's very simple for us, like getting a you know a copy of their divorce decree or marriage certificate from city hall is uh, can be kind of complicated for um, people who don't speak English or who are older. Um, so we help you know help them with all of that, and um, so that's one bucket and. Um, and the second one is uh, the litigation part, which is uh, when people are put into removal proceedings, they're told, you know, they're told to show up in, to immigration court in front of an immigration judge um, because uh, the Department of Homeland Security or ICE uh, thinks that uh, they are uh, removable, right, from the country for whatever reason. Um, I represent uh, some of those people, well, the people who find out about me and then call me. Um, <laughs> so um, so I do, I do some of that. And actually, um, you know, Pastor TJ actually really helped me out <laughs> um, with a client not so long ago. And this was in April. Um, yeah, it was in April. Um, so I've, I was, I've been representing a client since last fall uh, with his Ninth Circuit appeal. So if an immigrant is removed, ordered removed in immigration court, he can appeal first to the Board of Immigration Appeals. And if he loses there, he can appeal again to the Ninth Circuit. Um, and I took this case last uh, fall because of, at first when this client called and he was in the federal detention center, which is where immigrant uh, detainees are held. Uh, they're held in the federal prison because Honolulu doesn't have enough immigrant detainees to have its own immigrant detention center. So they're being held with federal and state prisoners in the same, you know, building. Um, so this client's family called and said, you know, they, they wanted some help. Uh, with his case, and at first, uh, I w when I heard the facts of the case, uh, so he was ordered removed because he had a conviction for drug possession, and uh, most most convictions are just uh, it's easy for ICE to just win those cases because uh, most convictions are just uh, you know the it's it's kind of open and shut for a lot of co types of convictions um, that they can just deport these people. Uh, but what uh, what happened was that, you know, as I did a little bit of research into the statute under which he was convicted, I found a different a case in the Seventh Circuit in Chicago, you know, in the Midwest um, that where the statute was identical to Hawaii's, um, but the Seventh Circuit court uh, said that it was not a deportable offense. So I decided, okay, if this guy lived in Indiana, he would be home right now. You know, he wouldn't be, you know, in the detention center. He wouldn't be being deported from his family. His entire family lives here. He's lived here for like 20 years. Um, all of his like life and roots are here. Um, so I decided I would help him and represent him in the Ninth Circuit. Um, so then what happened was that, you know, there was a bit of motions back and forth with the government uh, where they tried to dismiss the case uh, but we beat back that motion and then i and then i realized you know this guy has been in detention for uh almost 15 months 
um, since the start, you know, of the whole process. Um, and Ninth Circuit appeals can take years. And this is a pandemic as well. Yeah. So I really, I, I became really kind of desperate to um, try to, try to uh, get my client out of the federal detention center um, because of the pandemic and also just because I don't want him waiting, you know, uh, five years in de a detention for the Ninth Circuit, you know, to decide his case. Um, so, so I filed this motion and I thought it was a fairly uncontroversial motion, but then the, but then the ICE lawyer, you know, really fought on it. Um, and we had to have a, you know, its own hearing and the judge had to decide, you know, whether or not my client was entitled to a bond hearing at all, like even one bond hearing, which um, kind of shows how um, it really demonstrates the lack of basic uh, rights that immigrants have in our system. So if you're in the criminal justice system, for example, um, again, our criminal justice system has a lot, a lot, a lot of problems, um, but constitutionally, there are a few rights that are guaranteed to criminal defendants. So one is, you know, a right to a free attorney if they can't afford one. So immigrants do not get uh, free attorneys if they're in deportation proceedings. And in fact, the ACLU had this campaign a couple years ago where uh, they showed uh, video footage of like three-year-old children um, going in front of an immigration judge uh, during, you know, to prove their asylum case. Um, and these are like three-year-olds, right? <laughs> So they obviously don't understand what's going on and they can't represent themselves. Um, but just the, just they're not, you know, immigrants are just not entitled to a, a, a government provided lawyer. So unfortunately, there are lots and lots of, you know, children that have had to show up, you know, uh, as young as, you know, three years old to try to make a case in front of a, an immigration judge. So that's, that in itself is a big, you know, a difference that really matters, right? And then uh, secondly, you know, in terms of like uh, uh, detention, you know, um, if you are arrested and put in jail, you know, you'll just automatically get a, a bail hearing, right? Where a judge will figure out, you know, are you a danger to the community if I release you while you wait for your trial? Or are you a flight risk, right? Um, and in the criminal justice system, like no one questions the right to a bail hearing. Um, but in the immigration system, it's not a given. And like, as we saw in the Flores case, right, um, you know, multiple presidential administrations don't even want to give like mothers, uh, people who are asylum seekers, that kind of bond hearing. Um, so what happened was that my client, so they were fighting us, uh, fighting me about even getting uh, a, one bond hearing. And I kept, uh, I cited this case, uh, Casas Castrio, um, and I don't want to get too in the weeds of it, but it basically, uh, was a case in 2008, a Ninth Circuit case, where the person, Casas Castrillon, had been sitting in a detention center uh, waiting for his Ninth Circuit immigration appeal to be decided. He had waited for seven years Jeez. in the detention center. <laughs> yeah, without any, without any bond hearing, without a chance to tell the judge, look, you can release me because I'm not a dangerous person. And I will show up, you know, if I am deported, right? So this case is really important. And uh, ICE, you know, said, you know, there there was a Supreme Court case in 2018 uh, that said, uh, you know, immigrants are not entitled to automatic bond hearings every six months, which was a different case called Rodriguez. 
uh, where the Ninth Circuit said, uh, no, we need to give you know, bond hearings every six months um, and we want to avoid prolonged detention. Um, so the Supreme Court you know, uh, basically overruled that case and then they sent the case back down on a different, you know, to decide a different issue. But because of that case, ICE in this situation was saying, look, uh, Casas Castrillon is no longer a good law. So we had to fight about it. But ultimately, the good news is, is that the immigration judge here, um, you know, he followed the law and he said, okay, uh, my client is entitled to a bond hearing. So we had this bond hearing and then um, he set a bond amount uh, that for my client's family, because they're not, you know, very wealthy, would was prohibitive, right? It would have kept my client there for much longer, uh, waiting for his family to raise this amount of money. Um, and that's where Pastor TJ came in, <laughs> because wow. um, yeah, uh, well, I, I was, you know, Google around and I found out about the Hawaii Community Bail Fund, um, which I think was started to bail out the protesters at Mauna Kea. Um, and I sent them an email and I said, you know, they had never done an immigration bond before. Um, and so I kind of out of the blue sent them an email and they, they obviously don't know who I am. And then I kind of somehow remembered uh, Pastor TJ actually telling me that his friend was helping to run or start this bail fund. So I reached out to Pastor TJ and Pastor TJ immediately, you know, reached out to his friend um, and sort of got my request on the radar. Um, and it, and they, they did, they, uh, they paid for half of the bail bond amount, which is incredible, you know, and it was such a, a moment of um, I'm blanking on the Hawaiian term for this. It was like help, right? Kukui? K mm -hmm. I, I could be wrong. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it was such a nice uh, demonstration, particularly for me. I'm not from here. Um, to see like how members of this community really pulled together in the moment of my client's you know, need and, um, and, and helped him get released. And then the day that we went and actually posted the bond amount, Pastor TJ was there along with his friend. Um, and we waited almost a whole day, I think. We got there at like 10 in the morning and I think my client was released at like three because it took a long time to process everything. And, um, and then he came out and, um, you know, I was just kind of amazed by everything that happened because, um, you know, I can't really imagine what it would, what it was like for my client who has only seen the inside of the federal detention center, which is not a nice place to be, um, for 15 months and then to come out and see like the palm trees. It was a beautiful day. It was the sun. I mean, it was just like a gorgeous day. And, and I noticed that my client was just looking out the window kind of, and just like, um, like he just seemed like he couldn't really speak for a little bit because he was just taking it all in like, you know, um, and yeah, so it was, it was a really, really good experience. And, uh, you know, I owe Pastor TJ a lot for, for making it happen because I don't think, you know, without that personal connection, I don't know, you know, um, you know, if I could have gotten through on my own. So it was, it was, it was really good. Um, so, so I do, I do that, you know, I do um, representation of immigrants and their removal cases. Uh, I do appeals. Um, so right now I'm pretty much doing every, every possible type of immigration. Um, uh, case. Uh, but I think also what Pastor TJ was referring to is just since uh, Trump came into office, you know, the last uh, four years has just been a constant attack on immigrants. And his right hand man, Stephen Miller, who actually grew up not far from where I grew up, uh, ironically, um, he's very intelligent and he knows the immigration system actually quite well. So he knows how to make it 
much harder for uh, immigrants. And the Trump administration has uh, has gone after, you know, even legal, you know, the, all the rhetoric is about, oh, look at these people entering illegally over the southern border. Um, and they have made it very, very difficult for asylum seekers. And they're going to make it much harder in 60 days because they've proposed new rules for asylum that would basically make the standard impossible to meet. Um, but they've also attacked legal immigration, like green cards, like people who want to sponsor their um, family members uh, to come here from abroad. Uh, they've made it much harder by making the, the um, uh, what's called the public charge rule um, uh, harder to pass. Uh, so basically the public charge rule, it's been around forever. They've said, you know, the government looks at every green card applicant and their family and they say, oh, you know, if we think that you're going to go on public benefits, then we're not going to give you a green card. Um, and it used to be that if you if your income was 125 percent of the federal poverty um, line that that you were kind of you were supposed to pass. Uh, but that was the old rule. So the Trump administration passed a new rule that made it uh, much harder. They raised kind of the the amount of money that you need um, to get a green card. So that's that was another big change that you know I've been dealing with a lot in my practice because again I only serve low income clients, and so you know this new rule has kind of choked off a. a the opportunity to apply for a green card for a lot of my, you know, constituency. Um, and then, you know, I basically, I can go through like every, you know, DACA was another big one that, you know, thankfully the Supreme Court kind of temporarily put a halt on recently. Um, that's like a, a program that gave, you know, kind of a deferral from deportation for young immigrants who came over when they were children. Um, it, it go, the list goes on and on, but it, 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 it was really, it's really been a very, uh, tough, tough time for immigrants. Um, and you know, we're just, I mean, I, I just really, I don't know, philosophically, I, I, some days are very, very hard, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I work with a lot of clients who are homeless or in shelters and DV shelters, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people who need health insurance, who don't have health insurance and need a green card in order to get health insurance, um, um, including MedQuest, which is like Hawaii's Medicaid. Um, and yeah, it, it, there are some days when it's, it's really easy to get discouraged by uh, the challenges that my clients are facing. Um, of course, I can't really say this out loud to them because I don't want to be the lawyer that like, you know, makes them feel discouraged. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think we're doing the best that we can in a difficult time and just hoping that um, things will get better, you know, in the near future. So, yeah, sorry, that was a very long, again, long-winded response. It's great. I can tell everyone's actually paying a lot of attention to this stuff. <laughs> Um, what does bring you hope when uh, you're feeling like that for long periods of time? Um, so I definitely think that, you know, my clients themselves um, give me hope. Like uh, my experience here in Hawaii has been that everyone is very grateful, you know, that, you know, I'm just, I feel like I'm just extending a hand to them in difficult times um, through, you know, offering them free legal services. Um, and they always respond in such a gracious and uh, gracious way, you know, and um, yeah, and I think, you know, we do have, I don't want to, I don't want to say that, you know, we haven't had success uh, helping our clients uh, get immigration benefits. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the case that you helped us with was also a huge success. So moments like that, you know, really, really help. Um, 
And, you know, I think ultimately, like, uh, you know, uh, my family, we, uh, I, I, what I learned from my family, my parents and my grandparents, uh, they were all immigrants. They all face really challenging um, life circumstances, like, you know, growing up, um, you know, my grandparents on my dad's side, like, grew up in North Korea, and they fled, you know, uh, be right before the war to South Korea. And then of course, you know, um, my family, my parents grew up in South Korea during a time when uh, South Korea was an extremely impoverished country. And then they immigrated here. And so I think part of what gives me hope is like, I've seen, you know, examples of um, perseverance. Um, and I've seen, you know, my family, you know, um, succeed despite the challenges. So I feel like, you know, I am helping my clients along a path or a journey that like my family uh, traveled before. And so I'm always hopeful that their lives will get better. Um, not solely through me, but, you know, in general. And I'm just like one, you know, part of it. Yeah, it struck me very much when you were talking about being raised by a community, by an, Im by an immigrant community. Can you say some about how you grew up? I know you talked about your, your family family, but I think there's something there about the way Hawaii kind of functions and works and the way you grew up in a community. Can you say something about that? Yeah, I definitely think that, you know, Hawaii, they... Here, everyone emphasizes ohana, um, and you get love and support, not just from your blood you know, relatives, but from a larger community. And that very much mirrors you know, my experience growing up um, in Los Angeles, in the, the Korean immigrant community. Um, you know, I had many aunties and uncles who, uh, like, you know, they encouraged me academically, they um, encouraged whatever, as whatever I aspired to be. Um, you know, they really cultivated, you know, sort of a value a system and an ethic that valued, you know, uh, helping other people um, above, you know, making lots of money. I know the stereotype is, you know, Asian parents love when their kids make a lot of money and not that my parents would object to it, but I don't think that, <laughs> that <laughs> you know, they've told me many times that they're very proud that um, of the work that I am doing right now. And, you know, all the people that I've helped and with past cases and, um, and so, yeah. And then, you know, I just, I, oh, so I went to, you know, my parents, of course, like Korean uh, churches in LA were very, um, they were sort of the center of our entire social lives. So we would go to church, you know, in the morning and we'd spend a whole Sunday there, <laughs> you know, basically growing up um, in a church. Uh, and yeah, I met so many of my friends there. Um, and, you know, at the time, so my parents immigrated here in the mid 1970s. Um, and unlike now, back then, um, people who immigrated from Korea could only take a certain amount of money um, with them to the United States. And it was a very low amount of money because Korea was worried about losing currency. Um, and so a lot of the people here, I mean, I, I would say like, you know, they started off uh, low income, like my clients and, um, and they, you know, uh, I just remember like my parents and other, you know, aunties and uncles in the church, like if someone fell on hard times, they, they really stepped up. They always, you know, help that person. Um, and so, yeah, I, I totally see that in Hawaii too. And that was like the experience, you know, we had with that bond, right? Like um, that family needed, you know, the other half of that and they couldn't raise it, you know, amongst their own community. Um, although they did raise a lot of money within their yeah. own community, but um, 
but yeah, then, and then Selma, another community in, in Hawaii, like, really stepped up to help. So yeah, it's, a, it's really similar. It's very nice to see, especially in this day and age, I think, um, when it's less common. I, I feel like, you know, in my experiences on the mainland, it's a little bit less common to have that feeling. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I, I got in a, is a little bit about what's it actually like in federal detention? I, I can answer just a little bit and say that I've spoken with people who've been in federal detention here, and it is much better than being in OCCC or in a lot, like in other areas. Yeah. Like, federal, yeah. like the state prisoners who get transferred to federal, they are happy. So like, I don't mean to say it's good, but I do know that in Hawaii, <laughs> the federal detention center is where people want to be if they're going to be incarcerated for in the whole state. Right. That's where they want to be. That is not the case everywhere. Can I, There's just some questions about what's it like being there. And my guess is it's everything from tent cities up to the Hawaii federal detention and everything in between. But since someone asked, if you could just say a bit about that. Yeah, the... Um... The Federal Detention Center in Hawaii, I have heard, is actually very nice. Um, and I was, you know, I was actually thinking of doing an emergency motion um, when the pandemic started with in the Ninth Circuit. And because like there were immigration lawyers all around the country who were filing these motions, trying to get their clients out of the detention center. Um, and I was trying to find out more information about the uh, Hawaii Federal Detention Center. And I came across an article in like Honolulu magazine that was like rating the different detention centers, yeah. <laughs> like, it, like it was a travel magazine or something. Um, and like the Federal Detention Center got like five stars or something, like views of like the mountains and like <laughs> something like, it, I mean, it was, I think it was uh, tongue in cheek, um, because no one wants to be, you know, separated from their family, and no one wants to be like trapped, you know, inside a particular place and watched by prison guards. So, you know, there's that. But I, I have to say, you know, it is a little nicer um, than O Triple C or Halava, from what I've heard from my friends who are uh, public defenders and. Um, criminal defense attorneys, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, in the midst of this pandemic to see how uh, the agency, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, nationwide has really dug its heels in, um, you know, there are states like California and other places that in the midst of all this have been releasing, you know, prisoners to try to relieve the prison population in order to avoid, you know, huge outbreaks. But uh, ICE has really dug its heels in and, 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 and has really refused, unless there's a, a direct court order saying, you know, release, release someone, you know. Um, so there have been, uh, sadly, uh, you know, in some of the detention centers uh, in California and, and other places in the mainland, there have been very, very serious outbreaks. And I think so far, uh, three, three immigrant detainees have died of, of coronavirus. Um, and, oh, recently, actually, a Judge G ordered um, ICE to release uh, the uh, children who are currently being held in detention centers by July 17th. Uh, because uh, I think they're reported like 10 cases found of children who have had uh, coronavirus in those detention centers. So in a few days, we'll see if ICE, ICE will have to release the children, uh, but we'll see if they'll also release the parents or whether or not they'll, you know, do the family separation thing again. So that's just in a few more days. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very disheartening sometimes, um, you know, to be frank, you know, like to, to uh, go up against the department. Um, and I know, I know in some sense, like the lawyers that are my opposing counsel are kind of, uh, they might be, you know, good people, right, to their families, and they might just be kind of following the policy that's being set. Uh, by this administration, but it's, it is hard sometimes, you know, just to not want to kind of 
say, you know, this is, this is like a human, you know, issue, I think. And um, it's sometimes hard for me to understand why that, that, you know, um, why it's so hard sometimes to argue with them and to try to get them to see, um, see uh, these people that they're detaining as, as people and not just as, you know, um, as people that should be deported, I guess. Um, yeah. So coming to that, and I know we're, we're closing in a little bit on, on time here, but, uh, and you've been so generous uh, to share so much of this with us. So thank you. But two, th two things that folks always want to know is first, how really in two, you can maybe answer both is, how can we help you? How How is TLC receiving help? Is it, I know we have a congregant who's working for you also, uh, writing grants and stuff like that. Um, oh yeah. Suzanne, Suzanne Smallman is, is a grant writer for uh, TLC. And so, um, but ways we can help you and also ways that you think we can help this process if there's anything like that. I, as I have a lot of privilege as a lawyer and a minister I can go in and do some of these things, but like, how can folks help who want to feel like there's something to be done? So I think those are two big takeaways I think people would like to hear if you could. Yeah, so um, Bettina will uh, want me to plug. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're having like a online fundraiser on Thursday. Um, I will send the link to Pastor TJ and he maybe he can forward it to everyone here. Um, if you can send it tonight, then it can go out in tomorrow's yeah. email blast. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do yeah. that. Um, it, it, the registration for the fundraiser, though, is free and you don't have to, you know, give. Um, uh, just, you know, we'd like to have people kind of uh, participate and, and listen to um, uh the videos, interviews, and other people talking about the work that we do. Uh, so we'd really appreciate that. And that's kind of one way I think to show support is, um, yeah, just to be there with us and uh, listen as I guess we should talk story about what we do. Um, and then uh, like what Sistan is doing, like um, if you have, you know, a particular skills that could be useful um, both to a nonprofit organization or to um, an immigration law practice like in particular you know interpreters are always helpful um, because uh, people speak many different languages in Hawaii which is also different from you know where I uh, have been in the past um, so volunteer help is always appreciated and then um, um, and then I think third, like, uh, I, sometimes, you know, my work can feel a little bit isolating, um, because I see kind of how this system, uh, is kind of crushing people and ruining families and, um, and it can feel a little bit lonely sometimes, uh, just kind of, uh, being, you know, there for the clients. Um, and I think I would really appreciate, you know, in addition to, you know, prayer and thoughts and everything, um, you know, the more that people kind of like try to educate themselves about uh, immigration issues and like human rights issues associated with immigration, like I, I actually would really appreciate that, you know, and, and I think um, it would make the the battles sometimes feel a little less lonely yeah yeah it's uh i know it's daunting to hear this um it to speak with someone who's in the field like this and to hear what they're facing all the time uh as a pastor i i sh there are times where i i'm like i can't tell my people all of the horror that's really going on it's so disheartening it's almost that from a pastoral perspective I'm, I'm honestly just to be candid with folks on here it's almost like I don't know how helpful it is for me to be doing that but when people take it on themselves to really learn more and to even just to hear what you've what folks have heard today I think it's probably opened some eyes about what's 
really happening, not just on the Daily Show when they edit it all down and show you these <laughs> clips, but someone who's our neighbor who's doing this work, going to help our neighbors. Um, you know, as much as it's, it's, it's hard to hear all this, I do think, I'm guessing a lot of people on this call, as much as they're concerned of what they're hearing, are grateful and as, as kind of buoyed as I am uh, to know that someone we care about so much is doing uh, such important work. So we're really grateful that you're doing that. And we promise to do better about learning uh, more about what's going on and how we can help. So, yeah. Yeah, you, you, all of you are, uh, you know, uh, football fields ahead of, you know, uh, the average American, I think, um, just by showing up tonight, you know, I think, um, and giving me a little bit of time to kind of share, you know, what I've been experiencing, um, that's definitely helped me feel supported. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I really appreciate it. Good. I'm glad. Well, Esther, thank you so much. I know you said uh, you want us just to do work, but I'm going to pray for you anyway, even though you <laughs> more than the prayers. Thank and you. I think it's people, very important. People on here are all going to send you lots of care and, um, and hope. And we're really looking forward to getting the link, and we'll try to set up uh, as many people as we can to take part in the fundraiser, uh, the thank online you. fundraiser this year. Bettina is wonderful. We love her. And, yeah. and, and Sasan, I don't know anyone who doesn't love Sasan and Arn, so... Um, yeah. They're part of our family. So thank you again. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm so grateful we had this time.